Good evening. On behalf of the Sai Business School Board, it is my great honor to welcome you all to this inaugural Ruli Lecture Theatre and Dinner. We are delighted to say that this evening's lecture will also be live streamed via LinkedIn. This evening, we're here to celebrate the wonderful achievements of this school, as well as some of the most valued relationships. With us this evening, we have the change makers, the ones who believed and continue to believe in our vision. Without you, none of this would have happened, so thank you. I was still a young girl when the gleam in my father, Wafiq Saeed's eye, led to the idea of developing a business school. This was when he heard, almost by accident, about Oxford's wish to set up a school of management studies. If only he could find the donor it needed to get launched. I don't know whether many of you know, however, the journey really started with my grandfather, who created a university in Damascus. The actual genesis of the idea started with my formidable grandmother, who delicately encouraged her son and reminded him that his father had created a university which was Syria's first. So my father is a highly driven man. Um, so when it came time for him to make his mark, he did not want to simply create any center of learning, but a center of true excellence. The timing was impeccable. The marriage between the School of Management Studies and my father's desire to build a world-class institution were a perfect match. But the journey from the concept of a business school to actually getting it launched turned out <laughs> to be an epic one, strewn with obstacles and pitfalls. The fact that these were all overcome is testimony to two great values possessed by this school and those who have helped to make it the huge success that it is today. The values of purpose, persistent commitment to a shared mission, and responsibility, loyal commitment to community. The gleam in my father's eye focused unflinchingly on excellence. He didn't want to found a business school because it was Oxford. He wanted to found the most dynamic business school anywhere in the world. He's an ambitious man and believed that for his school to make the difference to the study and business of pra practice of business, it needed two things in addition to the university's plan. First, it needed to be fully integrated with the university to ensure that all the learning and community Oxford had to offer is an integral part of the school's offering. And so the plan changed. From the one where the school students would live and work outside Oxford in one college in Kennington to one where the school would exist at the heart of the university with its students and faculty and all of its colleges and, inter, in, inter, um, and intellectually connected to all its departments. Secondly, the school needed enough independence to function, as every successful business school must, as a great business, not only as a great academic department. And this was not a model the university was yet familiar with, and conversations over the years have been an extraordinary example of trust, diplomacy, and unrelating, unrelenting energy culminating into the relationship we have today. It is a testament to all those people who have worked tirelessly to create the institution we are in this evening. And it will last alongside Oxford University for generations to come. 
Thankfully, these early discussions were fruitful, as today there is a relationship of trust between the university and the school, which enables the school to pursue its mission, whilst also being a purposeful and responsible member of the university. At the school, no one has done more to shape and realise the agenda than our incredible Dean, Peter Tufano, whose leadership of the school has been an inspiration to us all. Today, even my father is satisfied that the excellence he foresaw has been realised. As a family, we could not be more proud. I could not be more proud. Not only of this excellence, but of the school's leadership in driving forward responsible business, young entrepreneurship, and the role of business as a force to resolve world-scale problems. Thank you for showing me what is possible with drive and determination. I'm very grateful to you. Of course, the journey continues. And most recently, many of you in this room, alongside my father, have pledged support to ensure that the school's next building, the redeveloped power station, becomes a further milestone on the road to providing Oxford answers to world challenges. These are exciting times for the school and, we're on the, and we on the school board are delighted to have you all with us on this journey. Thank you all. And who better to lead us as we continue along our challenging yet exhilarating journey than Paul Holman, our new chair. There are few better exemplars of the best, most responsible style of business leadership. Throughout his career, including as CEO of Unilever, Paul has clearly demonstrated that responsible business is also good business. His track record has resulted in a string of awards and accolades and puts him in great demand as a leader of some of the most influential bodies working to encourage a better way of doing business. He and the school are a perfect match for each other and we are absolutely delighted that he will be with us in this next hugely exciting phase of the school's development. We are all tremendously thrilled to see what will come in the next phase of the school's development under his stu stewardship and guidance. Who could be better to deliver the first Ruli lecture? Who more fitting to talk to us about how we can all act purposefully and responsibly in responding to world challenges? Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our new chair, Paul Polman. So I get the pleasure of being up here with Paul for the next 45 minutes. Uh, just so everybody understands the ground rules, for the first 30 or so, Paul and I will have a conversation. And the last 15, it's over to you. Now, you are in this room, but you're also on LinkedIn Live. And you, some of you may be in an overflow room. And so what we'll be doing is taking questions from the audience. But also, I'm not going to be checking emails, but I will be checking questions. Uh, that uh, you'll be sending along. There'll be a, a, a hashtag up there for a little bit. On with the, uh, the evening. Uh, we have good governance in the school. And so when it was time for us to find a new board chair to, you know, after Howard Stringer, who's here, had done such a wonderful job, um, I did a bad thing. I, I took out a sheet of paper and I wrote one name on that sheet of paper. Um, now, there was a full process with a full committee and lots of names. But when it was all done, I was thrilled that the name on that sheet of paper at the very beginning was the name of the person sitting here. Because I couldn't think of a boss that I'd rather work for than Paul Pullman. So everything that Rasha said, let me just underscore that. 
Um, tonight, we're about answering the call. Um, and we all, Rasha talked about world scale problems. And if you watched the film that was up here beforehand, you'll know that that's some of the themes that we're going to talk about. So Paul, first of all, thank you for, for coming. And thank you for chairing the school. But let's start with the challenges that the world's facing. You have been one of the most clear uh, uh, articulators of the issues that the world is facing right now. And then you've helped to write the playbook, as it were, the U UN SDGs. Um, there's 17 different SDGs. How do you make sense of all the things that we have to do? And how would you prioritize what needs to be done in the world right now? Yeah. Well, first, Russia, thanks for your kind words. I'm always happy that my mother isn't in the audience when you say those things. But, uh, and also what has been built here is obviously an honor to be a part of it a little bit in its own little way at an exciting time because changes are happening and they're happening at a faster pace than we've ever seen it before. It gets also to your question on the Sustainable Development Goals. In uh, 2015, 193 countries came together at the UN and, and actually signed these Sustainable Development Goals, which is quite a feast because it's very difficult nowadays to get any global agreements of any magnitude. And uh, in the absence of us having governance at a global level that functions, we have a moral framework now that is called the Sustainable Development Goals. And the objective of the goals came actually out of Kofi Annan's idea in the year 2000 to take a 15-year period from 2000 to 2015 to develop what was called at that time the Millennial Development Goals, but had a very simple objective to halve the number of people living in poverty. And that was defined at that time as $1.25 a day. And we actually achieved that. Obviously, China was a big part of it, but many others. But these millennial development goals were very much towards the developing markets, and they were the issues of that time that needed to be addressed, eight simple goals. Uh, then in the year 2015, a little bit before that, actually, at the Rio Plus 20, some people got together, some countries got together and said, well, if we have half the number of people in poverty, why don't we use the next 15 years to finish the job, you know? Apollo 13 didn't go halfway and said, you know, let's go home because the food is better. Or Eugene Ball didn't stop in 50 meters and said, I'll do the other 50 meters another time. So it's really absolutely feasible to finish the job. And that's really what the Sustainable Development Goals are all about. The overall objective is best captured by saying to irreversibly eradicate poverty and doing that in a more sustainable and equitable way. 17 goals, 169 targets. And that is a little bit the complexity of the world right now. Some people are overwhelmed by that. And uh, I know some of the CEOs are, and we're trying to keep that communication fairly simple and effective, but that is what it takes. The most important, uh, so, so the most important thing, obviously, is goal number one, that is poverty alleviation. Uh, there's, there's two burning issues in this world that are expressed in these goals that, for me, are priorities, which is goal number one, which you could argue is inequality, and the other one is climate change. And they are actually two sides of the same coin. Uh, it's very easy to explain that the devastating issue of climate change that we're dealing now with in all parts of the world, obviously very uh, prevalent, is affecting the poor far more than anything else. And we're at the moment again in history where we're actually driving more people into poverty as a result of that. So people like Greta Thornburn who say, why, do I sh why should I go to school if you guys are doing things and creating a world I can't live in anyway, is obviously an extreme position of that. But there is an element of truth in that. And, and it permeates all the things. Like if we don't detect climate change, then uh, obviously we're destroying our nature, we're destroying our land, we're destroying our oceans. Uh, the poor people suffer most, women and girls are pushed back. Uh, it affects sanitation, water, health, and as a result, uh, the, the overall sustainable development goals will be very difficult to achieve. The reality is we're five years in, the plane is well on the runway, but we haven't even heard the engines rev. Uh, the reality is, since the Paris Agreement, which dealt with goal number 13, climate action, our emissions have gone up even further. Uh, we, any of the agreements that the countries have signed at that time, besides that most governments have changed at a speed that is un unheard of nowadays, 
Uh, we've actually had none of the governments, with a few exceptions perhaps, but none of the governments of substance that have actually fulfilled any of those commitments. And that is a little bit dangerous because 2020 is the year that every country needs to come in with higher ambitions. So that's what we're focused on now. And you're getting now to the bizarre situation a little bit that I think the private sector is starting to run ahead of the uh, governments in terms of wanting to implement that because they internalize these costs apparently quicker than, than governments do. Let's stay with the, with the challenges that the world's facing. You are a master of facts. You and I were together on Monday. You spoke to three different audiences. You reeled off facts around the number of trees in the world, um, the loss of species, and on and on. In fact, somebody who was at one of the meetings with me remarked afterwards, is, how do you know all this? Um, but the other thing is, how do we communicate? How is it that we communicate to the world what's going on? Are facts enough? What's the communication strategy that's going to take in order for more people to buy into no. the agenda that needs to be done? So it's a whole discussion, a separate discussion, what facts are nowadays. And that's also a, a, an art that has developed in, in alternative facts that make the issue a little bit difficult. And we elect politicians that seem to be good at it in some countries in the world. Uh, this country not excluded from it. But, but um, so, so um, let's just not go to the discussion of facts or not facts, but let's just go to science. You know, you have climate change. You have 97% of the scientists in this world that are in agreement that there is an issue. I'm not sure that the scientists or the academics in this case, uh, the people that work the IPCC reports, as they are called, doing themselves a favor. Because any time a scientist writes down something, there are 10 ifs and buts. And we can't 100% be sure, but we're nearly sure. And the scientists, in this case on climate change, I think have positioned it very scientifically, but not in a language and not in a certainty that is, is uh, unfortunately needed. And the reality is that every IPCC report that has come out has understated the risk versus what is happening uh, in reality. I mean, we now have, the, we have fires in the Arctic. We have uh, the permafrost melting. We have forests being destroyed at a higher rate than, than we'd ever expected. And, and the reality is that we are actually very close to what some people would argue would be a negative feedback loop. And the scientists have always said, even when we discuss with them, yes, but we always have to leave a little bit of a sense of doubt or we cannot take a position because we're scientists. And that hasn't helped in the process. So the result is that there are some skeptics still in the, in, in the world. And how do you communicate with them or drive them into action? The first thing I would say myself, at least to myself, is you, know, you have to decide your most precious commodity that you have is time. So you have, to you have to decide where you spend your time. And actually, the skeptics are becoming significantly less. They get a share of voice that is disproportionate because the, the media obviously, obviously likes to jump on that. But in reality, that's, that's fewer and fewer than you think. In the US now, we're just trying to get a coalition together to run some ads so that the US understands what it means to go out of the Paris Agreement. But 77% of Americans want the US to stay in the Paris Agreement. Uh, even amongst the Republicans, 80% think, over 80% think, that climate uh, crisis that we have is a man-made issue. So the way to talk to people that are skeptics, if you want to spend too much time on that, which I don't think you should, but the first thing is not different from Brexit here, etc. when you have these debates, whatever side of the debate you're on, I think we have started to not communicate with each other, but to shout at each other. We've become very judgmental, more polarized even because of social media. And we judge people. We don't listen anymore. And, and listening is as much with the heart as with the head. So if a person is a climate denier, I'm not against that person. They're all here for a mission. They're all you know, good intent. And we're not going to be judgmental there. So the first thing might be to try to understand what is going on. And there's a difference, in my opinion, between skeptics and, and cynics. A cynic I don't have much time for, because a cynic is an abdication of responsibility that I find is the lowest level of leadership. And fortunately, we don't have that many people that fall under that category. And we should really let them be what they are. And their circle will shrink by itself. You don't want to have too many cynics as friends uh, and go to the borrowers. But the skeptics are actually uh, good, because they challenge you on what you need to do. They challenge you on, on the way you need to think about it. And there are some different theories. You know, Some people might say the sunspot theory, which has been uh, you know, well, well proven wrong, or, or we've had uh, 
temperature changes in the past. We, the people forget to mention that there weren't so many humans living on this earth and we weren't invented yet to the extent that we are now. Or some people might really say it's religious conviction, you know, if, uh, which you find in the Bible Belt, etc., that this is God's will and we shouldn't intervene with that. So people have different opinions and try to understand them, try to keep the tone positive and, and um, try to get these people on board, not on the issue of climate change or making them scientists, but try to get them into specific issues that are relevant to them as well. I find, for example, air pollution is a very easy one to say. You know, if you now live in Delhi, it's not a pretty picture. You know, 10 of the 20 most polluted cities are in India. And, uh, and London is one of the three most polluted cities still in Europe, next to Moscow and Rome. So, you know, if people understand that it's not a good thing that 8 million people prematurely use their, lose their lives because of air conditioning, or uh, air pollution. Uh, deforestation, people understand. Uh, having more plastic in the oceans than fish is, is not a good thing. It's easier to understand. And um, so you, you just bring it down to the reality and you talk opportunities. Most people, especially in the business community where you still find a lot of skeptics or people who really don't see the issue affecting them and as a result not really interested in the science, etc. You just talk risks and opportunities and that seems to be uh, ringing a bell with them. So you tailor your messages. With this administration, I actually went to the White House because I, I thought I could never criticize them if I don't do everything within my powers to convince this current president to stay in the Paris Agreement. And I, that was one of the few nights in my life I didn't sleep. I like to sleep during the night to be functioning during the day, but that one didn't work. <laughs> and I, you know, I thought, what, what would you do? And, and at the end of the day, uh, we didn't succeed because it was like, what do you have for me? And you know, are you going to invest more and all that? Whilst the reality is already we have 3.3 million jobs in green energy in the US, which is three times more than, than fossil. Um, you know, more, more jobs are created by an infinite. Uh, we have 4,000 uh, governors, uh, uh, sub-state level cities, uh, businesses that have signed up to the Paris uh, targets. We have citizens shouting out, the financial market moving, employees walking out. You can read now the papers every day. Um, the Jeff Bezos signed his commitment to be on the Paris trajectory by 2040. But that's because otherwise 2,000 employees would have walked out. Google employees are now pressuring. So you're seeing phenomena happening that I think the whole world starts to get into action. And businesses are starting to understand it's a good thing. You know, Just to move to green energy, I've never had a compromise in my time in Unilever. We're 100% green energy. But, but um, in most of the world right now, you can have solar and uh, wind at a cheaper price than coal you could actually decide which we should to obsolete every coal plant and it wouldn't be a tough financial decision. So if people don't believe in it at all and they are totally skeptics, I'm starting to think as I talk, I would just talk the same language as Trump. You know, they're casino builders, they're constructors. So you just have to talk the language of a casino, I guess. And you have to just say to them, for example, okay, well, let's look at the last five years or 10 years or the years moving forward. And there are more extreme um, temperatures, more extreme colds as a result of climate change that some people don't understand, and more extreme warms. So these demagogues come into Congress with an ice ball in their hands and say, you know, look what is global warming, and Trump has used that. So you just say to them, you like casinos, you like building casinos. So if you bet on extreme highs or extreme lows, you'd expect over time that to be 50-50 the color black and the color red, if you don't believe in climate change. And what you now see, and you can take any 5, 10, 15, 20 years, that every month, every month, we're hitting a higher temperature. In fact, last month was a record. Again, the month before was a record. Uh, 12 of the last 14 years have been records. So statistically now, you're in a situation that 60, 70% of these bets of extremes are actually to warmer temperatures. Now, then you ought to believe that there is something happening that is changing. So if you can get people to understand that with these simple storytellings wherever they are, I think you can try to, uh, to change them. Uh, ultimately, what will change the skeptics that are, that are uh, on the sideline right now is uh, the economic force. Where there might not be a moral force, there will definitely be an economic force because we're at the point now that it's becoming very um, dangerous as you, if you run a company if you don't 
start to run your company as being part of the future and you want to keep your company in the past. Uh, companies that now have uh, taken action on climate have a higher return, have a lower risk. The financial community is investing in them. You look at the fossil company returns now and the green economy returns. The last two years, the, uh, the green economy has outperformed by 17%. So to be an irresponsible CEO. The only CEOs I can understand that don't do anything are perhaps the ones that are so fested in what the current system gives them. You know, if you're a 100% oil company and you don't know that there's another form of energy, you might hang on to something because it's profitable for you, but that's really few. But I think most of the CEOs are starting to understand now that, that uh, that's the only way to make that transition is the only way to stay relevant. Let's stick with the CEOs and businesses. In the film that played a little bit before, your language was, we can't have business as usual, we have to have business unusual. For sure. So what does unusual business look like? Because you know, most of us have lived through a world of very usual business. And so what are some elements of unusual business that uh, our students and our alums and you know, our, our friends wouldn't normally think about? So the, um, we are actually in the most dangerous point where, where uh, contrary to the, first, uh, the, the previous question, where the bulk of the people know what needs to be done. You won't find any CEO who says, I want more air pollution, I want to cut more forests, or I want to have more people go to bed hungry. You just won't find them. So we're basically all good people. And we also think we're all doing the right thing. Every company now has a page two of the annual report or corporate social responsibility, whatever name we give it, which says, you know, I'm not the problem because I do this and this. And someone else then must not be doing it if we have this. But collectively, it's not adding up. We're not moving. The direction might be right, but the scale and speed with which we're moving is not right. And the reason for that is really that we're, staying, that we're stuck in a current system, that any change you make within a current system will automatically push you back to something that is marginal improvement and not the step change that we need. And the step change that is needed is obviously science-based for the time that we have. Like you take climate change that we talked, we need to reduce our absolute carbon emission every 10 years by 50%. So that's a science, that's a fact-based thing. So, and right now we're not seeing that happening at that scale. So people behave on, based on the boundaries. It's, so th if they're not bad people, why do we not collectively uh, get the results? It's because people behave based on the boundaries that are put around them. So you take, for example, in, an example from Unilever, if we would reward our salespeople selling soap and shampoos and soups and all these products, if we would reward them on the number of orders they would write, they probably would write a lot of orders, but they would be very small because the reward is the number of orders. If we would reward them on, let's say, customer service, their behavior will be different. So we've created boundaries in this world that, uh, and politi politics has become so short term that we deal with consequences of things, but never get to the underlying causes. So what are the four major systems changes that we need to work on? which require business unusual, which require us to feel uncomfortable. The first one is we need to decarbonize our global economy. We like it or not. Um, the maximum we can handle in our natural biodiversity ecosystem is about seven to eight gigatons. So there is obviously a little bit of carbon emission, but significantly less than what we're currently doing by a factor of miles. And, and we just don't know how to do that. And uh, we are carbon junkies. The second thing we need to do um, we have discovered that it's great that we have people on the planet, but we were actually uh, a, a few people on a big planet, and now we are a lot of people on a small planet. You know, we have uh, tripled in population in the last 50 years. We have grown our GDP uh, by, by eight or nine times over that period of time, and we have created a consumption system that is very linear of, of digging the resources out of the ground, stuffing it in a factory, using it, and then dumping it on the landfill or in the oceans. And the reality is we're just using far more resources than the world can, can afford, than can replenish. Uh, July 29th this year was the date that we actually used up all the resources for, for this year, which means that we're already using up 60% more than, than we can afford to. And that is basically being done, not to confuse you, by about 1.7 billion people that use 85% of the world's resources. And frankly, the other 6 billion people aspiring to do the same. So the numbers don't add up anymore. So the second big systems change that we need to make is move from a linear economy and consumption pattern to a circular. And I would argue that soon people will discover 
that circular is not enough, but that it has to be regenerative. And that is very well possible. You know, waste was invented by human beings. Nature doesn't have waste. Before we were there, there's no waste. We have created the concept of waste. So I started running Unilever, zero waste. And we, uh, people said it could not be done. I said, we want zero waste. And uh, give you five years to do it. They did it in three years. But it saves you money. People are more motivated. Your quality goes up. A lot of other benefits. The third system change that we need to have is to move the financial markets to the longer term. That's a tough one. But you cannot solve the issues of climate change or food security or poverty by running the binoptic red race of quarterly reporting. And unfortunately, we don't have, all have the luxury of being a, a privately held company or controlled by a foundation or other things. We are publicly traded companies. And um, there's so much money that has been pumped in the global economy, which started already under Volcker and, and Clinton at that time, actually, that they liberated these financial markets and that these banks create all these financial instruments. You know, the financial crisis in 2007, 2008 was caused, the Lehman crisis, what we call financial crisis, was basically 450 billion of bad debt. We now have infinitely more. That was at a time that we had financial instruments in the world with a global economy of 80 trillion. We had financial instruments of about 300 trillion. We now have over 600 trillion of financial instruments. And they're so far removed from the real economy, which is only 80 trillion. That doesn't make sense. And they're all chasing returns. So the financial market is becoming shorter and shorter term, and they're willing to do anything to get a little bit of return. Half the world's money right now is earning zero and negative interest rates. You know, so many of the people in the financial market, they're willing to kill their grandmothers to get a little return and make a bonus. So um, if we don't move these financial markets to the longer term, it's not going to work. And governments need to step in, their regulators need to think about it. And that's obviously very difficult because... You know, the financial market has now become, or the, the real economy has now become subservient to the financial market, whilst in reality, you'd want the financial market to be subservient to the real economy. And that frightens individual governments because the financial market has infinitely more power than most governments in the world. So we need to change that system. And the fourth system and final system that we need to change that is big enough to mention is that we have an economic system that benefits the few but not the many, and a system where too many people feel they're not participating or, or excluded from will ultimately rebel against itself. I've said that 10 years ago, I've said that 15 years ago, and what you now see is, you see, uh, as I talk, sit here, about 15 countries where people are in the streets, from Hong Kong to Chile to Bolivia to Iraq to Uzbekistan to, to many other places in this world. The citizens of this world just don't accept anymore what is happening. And all the value creation in our economic system is on capital, but very limited on labor. And that's why you have the Trumps and the Brexits for the good or for the bad, if you want to. So we have to find an economic system that is more inclusive and where we uh, have a different uh, tax system, we have a different uh, reward system. Now, historically, we would be depending on governments to deal, take care of that and, and duly elected democratic governments. And they have brought us quite far in, in the wealth that we have all created. But as governance now doesn't work because most of the institutions we have created were created in 1944 at Bretton Woods when the world was quite different and we've never adjusted the institutions. So global governance is a little bit at a vacuum right now. And in fact, it's going in the wrong direction if you read the newspapers. And that means that we have to step up. We cannot as we have benefited from governments for a long time, I think we now need to help governments. And my point is then it means uh, leaders of this world in other capacities, be it in civil society or be it in, in NGOs, or obviously most importantly in the private sector, need to help de-risk that political process. And where you need to feel uncomfortable is, and why it is the uncomfortable and business unusual, if you don't feel uncomfortable with driving some of these changes, which will obviously have a certain level of resistance, you're not going far enough and fast enough. And businesses itself as well, when we made a plan to totally decouple our growth from environmental impact, for example, I didn't know how to achieve that, but I knew it was the right thing to do. And then you get a lot of good people that you hire that figure out how to do it smartly. You don't need to eat the elephant in one bite, but you need to have an idea of where you want to go and what the world needs. And that should be at where we are, a little bit uncomfortable. So, Paul, I know you'd rather talk about the world than talk about yourself, but I want at least one question there. Your career started in Procter & Gamble. You were there for 27 years, then to Nestle, 
then to Unilever. You've been a cost analyst, a managing director of regions, a CFO, a CEO. And I was going back over the history. When you moved to Nestle, your mentor at Procter & Gamble described you as a future and results-oriented manager who cuts through bureaucracy, bureaucracy and politics, a good marketer with an interest in innovation. But along the way, you've You never become... told me that in a performance review. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you oh, the article. I know who that guy is. <laughs> But along the way, you've become this emblem of the voice and conscience of business. How did this happen? Was this a Paul falling off the horse type experience? Or how is it that you went from being a CFO and a cost accountant to the leader that you are now? Well, I think that's, I, I, and it's certainly not the only one. We're very blessed with many leaders. And one of the reasons I got attracted to the side business school is we are actually doing the, one of the most noble things is create these leaders. And obviously, um, it doesn't mean that we didn't have good leaders in the past. It meant that a lot of the issues that we are now dealing with were perhaps not known uh, 5, 10, 15, or 20 years ago on things. So we should also dare not be too judgmental. But the reality is that we need a different type of leadership now. The reality is that the issues that have been created cannot be solved anymore at the level they have been created. So it, it requires different partnerships. So we need leaders that are able to work in these different partnerships with civil society, with governments. Even when I started Unilever 10 years ago, my advice I got from one of my predecessors was stay away from the NGOs. Well, as a Dutchman, the first thing I do is call these NGOs. Because, you know, you cannot function anymore if you don't work together. You don't have that license to operate, especially if these things are, the trust levels are so low. So you need leaders that work in partnership. You need leaders that think intergenerational. You know, it's very easy to just, um, you know, be a hero in the way we measure success with the financial market and become very short term. And you can lift that game for five years or, or, or six years if you're lucky, but it runs to an end. And... Running a business for the longer term requires quite some other skills, thinking intergenerational. We bought a company in the US called Seventh Generation, and one of the reasons I was interested in that company was clearly the philosophy. Everything we do, we think seven generations ahead. So you need leaders that can obviously think intergenerational. You can leaders that think systems change. The world is very difficult to get your hands around. You know, If you talk water, then you already talk energy. If you talk energy, you talk food. And uh, getting your hands around the sustainable development goals, simplifying them, translating them to specific action is not that easy. So it requires that different form of leadership. How and did you get to this? well, I'm trying to avoid talking about myself, as you notice. <laughs> so what the business schools need to now do is to think about that and, and think about how do we create these leaders? Because we, we clearly have a vacuum there. An average tenure of a CEO has now dropped to four and a half years of these multinationals and. Of Fortune 500 companies, and that's that's a big worry to me. So how do I get to this is nothing else than anybody else. In, in your life, you have a lot of crucibles. My parents met in Boy Scouts, so I was always in Boy Scouts my whole life, so I got a certain appreciation for nature and planet Earth. We grew up just after the Second World War. When I was born in 56, I thought that was a long time after the Second World War, but the older I get, I notice how close it was after the Second World War. But, you know, their whole goal was, my father worked in a factory, their whole goal was to get their kids. And he, uh, by the way, he worked in a factory because he was a reasonably intelligent man, but the, the war had taken his school away. He absolutely missed school, living on the German border in the Netherlands at that time. So if your high school is taken away, your university is taken away, a lot of possibilities are taken away. So their goal was not only peace, why we created Europe, uh, their goal was also to ensure that the other generation, the next generation, would be better off than themselves. And they were unselfishly investing in us. They, they showed what it meant, you know. They understood that uh, greed might be good to some, but generosity is better. So they were community people. They were church people. They were helping the poorer people. They were connected to nature and understood the harmony, and they had a vision of what it should be for next generations. Unfortunately, we lost that a little bit. But then during your life, you get some of these crucibles that perhaps uh, make you aware of some of the things that are going on and that you need to respond to. I, I worked at one point in time in Newcastle, and that was the first time in my life that I saw um, people that had never seen their parents work, which was a strange concept to me. But the shipbuilding and the coal and the steel had hammered that region in such a devastating way that if you were a 14-year-old girl, the only thing you could possess was a baby, so they became pregnant and making things worse. And 
so, so how do you lift up a community like that? And we were the biggest employer there at that point in time for a company I was working in. You know, you cannot function in a community that doesn't function. So you need to have a responsibility to make these communities work. And it's actually good business if you think about how to do that. Like these SDGs are good business. And then, you know, other things happen to you that you need to think about. But at the end of the day, it boils down to values because it's a little bit of a, a, you know, what are your values in life and what do you want to do? What is your purpose and why are you here? And what type of difference do you want to make? That's, and that you have to answer yourselves. But you cannot sit here and be a zombie and let your life go by. That would be an enormous waste of incredible resources. And I just feel that I've been incredibly lucky not to have to worry about education because the Dutch government paid it, not to worry about food because my parents could provide it. I had a piece of bar soap, so I made it past the age of five. We always had one toilet at home, although we had six brothers and sisters. Uh, it was always a fight to, to own that space, but at least we had a toilet. So I'm very fortunate, but you know, then you start realizing that you're only 2% of the world population that, that is in that position, that can do what they want, work where they want, be financially independent then you, you, know, you have to put yourself to the service of the other 98%. You know, if, um, you know, that's living a life with purpose is why we're all here. Let's put ourselves to the service of this audience for the moment. And uh, let me turn it over to them. So who'd like to ask questions? And I'm going to take out this device. So if those of you who want to put up, if you want to send them electronically, that's how you, where you go. Um, but uh, Those we're are also, usually the tougher questions. Those are usually the tougher <laughs> questions. Um, and uh, we will uh, kind of, but we're also taking questions from the audience. So who'd like to get started? Okay, there's, there's two right there. Let's do the person on the right, uh, closer to you, yes. Um, is this on? Yep. Yep. Uh, thank you both very much. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, my question is about um, leadership traits, I guess you could say. You mentioned during your talk that it's often hard to find solutions inside a system that created problems. And I want to speak to something I'm going to call feminine leadership. And by that, I don't mean leadership necessarily espoused by women, but simply those that are often associated with feminine traits. Um, there's growing support for a more feminine leadership paradigm that emphasizes communication, compassion, and empathy, uh, potentially understanding um, others and consequently considering all stakeholders. Now, this compares with the typically uh, masculine conceptions of leadership. Can we make a quick question? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's quick. Uh, and these are value potency, concrete measures of achievement, etc., etc. Now, my question is, are men inherently worse at being genuine climate conscious leaders? And do you perceive uh, conventional conceptions of masculinity as a barrier to corporate leadership change and broadening stakeholder considerations? So I'm going to take two or three questions, uh, and then we'll... And then we'll kind of give them over to Paul. So who next? Uh, this gentleman here. Um, um, kind of up, up a little. No, up, 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 up. Yeah, wave, wave a little bit. So we could, there, there you go. If you don't mind, say your name or and yeah. what you're doing or what you should be doing. <laughs> yes, I'm. Yep. I'm Chris Mafidon. I supervise research in technology. I just wanted to find out what role you think technology will play in answering these big questions, the real, real problems. The question is, sorry? Sorry, I missed the two. Sorry. Yeah. What role do you think technology yeah. will sorry. play? I got that. Right. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Third question. Actually, uh, Great. I, I suppose there we go. Um, yeah. Up there. Yeah. Hi. Is this on? Is this on? It is on. You've okay. got one in your hand. Go right ahead. Hi there. Uh, real privilege to hear you speak and very inspiring. So thank you very much. Um, I'm a medical student here at Oxford. I wanted to ask about your four system changes. I can see how a number of them you can work through them in a sort of step by step process, but in particular that fourth one, the one that I think is is the real sort of crux issue. I'm unclear as to how you could achieve that. That seems more like a paradigm change rather than something that could be done incrementally in little steps. So I'm wondering whether or not you could lay out what you thought a pipeline towards that could be. 
So that fourth one, particularly about individual participation and dis disillusionment with um, stakeholder capitalism, shall I say. Okay, that seems like a, a pretty good uh, set to start with. Um, and we have about 10 minutes total here, so um, we'll try to answer these and then we'll go to a few more. So I keep it uh, very short, but the, the first one, there's no, I think, overwhelming evidence. You don't need to really um, um, show that anymore, that um, if your organizations are better in uh, gender balance, you also have a better performance. Uh, it, is, it is ridiculous to think that you can run societies or businesses uh, with the best talent, which is obviously the key driver of success, if you only recruit from 50% of the population. That's what we've basically done and still are doing in many of these institutions that are heavily dominated by white males. So having diversity and certainly the gender diversity is a big part of that. There are other parts of diversity if you want to be successful. And the benefits of that diversity, I don't need to go into. Uh, also the benefits of the global economy. What um, McKinsey just put a study out that if you would give women in the world, which in no country in the world, women have the same rights as men, even today, even in the UK. I can have a discussion with you on that for every country in the world. But if you would give women the same access to land rights, financing, or education, just three very simple things, education, land rights, and financing, then you would unlock the global economy by $26 trillion. That's five times more than the implementation of what it costs every year for all of the sustainable development goals. So there is no doubt Peter Sanchez has done a lot of work on that at MIT. Um, and he talks about, uh, he, he probably expresses it more academically, but what I understood from it was, you know, you look at partnership, women are just better at that. You look at purpose, women are just better at that. You look at intergenerational or thinking longer term, women are just better at that. There's, there's win-lose that meant for our survival and, you know, uh, instinct and, and uh, that we have to deal with women are much more cooperative. And a lot of that can be explained by the evolution of human beings if you want to go into that. So I do agree and, and I'm very proud to say that when I came in Unilever, 38% women in management and when I left 50%, zero women in the board, 50% women in the board. And 50 wasn't an objective for me, it just became no issue anymore. We just solved that and the company was so much better for it. So. Um, there is a book that uh, goes a little bit far that got my interest that I picked up that came out a few years ago, which was called The End of the Age of Men. And so I got a little bit worried, so I took that book. <laughs> so for the men in the audience, there is a purpose still. Don't worry about that. The role of technology is very important because obviously over history, we have been able to lift people out of poverty by leveraging technology. The Industrial Revolution was a technology in itself. The age of the computer, the fourth Industrial Revolution where we are, we all are uh, benefiting from technology. And again, today, if, if the topic wasn't climate change, but the examples we use were climate change, it would be great if we have better storage, uh, a battery capacity, or if we could do carbon capture storage uh, in an economically viable way. So technology, if we could apply artificial intelligence uh, to some of these solutions, we could come quicker uh, to, to uh, the right answer. So technology will always play a role. But I'm always a little bit hesitant when, when I get a question like this, because what I'm arguing for is that most of the issues that we are now facing that is causing us the stress that we're seeing in society, why only 13% of people go to work and are engaged, why suicide rates are going up, mental illnesses are going up, uh, people are in the streets, this is really a, a period that we have to go back to well before 1900 to find the same phenomena. It's because of, of a lack of human willpower. The key question we have to ask is, do we really care? And I ask that to the CEOs, especially that I deal with, with the, in the private sector. Do we really care? You know, we're cutting down forests as if that's the only way to produce food in this world. You know, we're wasting 30 to 40% of the food, which itself is the third biggest carbon emitter if, if that would be a country. You know, do we really care? We know how to build houses, yet the number of homeless go up. We know how to grow food, yet we have 100, 826 million people going to bed hungry every night, not even knowing how, if they wake up the next day. We certainly know how to produce sanitation and build toilets, yet we have one and a half billion people that don't have that. 
We know how to make a piece of bar soap, but we're keeping it away from five million children so they die before the eights are five. So it's a matter of willpower. The discussion in this country was 0.7% of GDP, and it is now enshrined in law, and hopefully that doesn't change. But the, the rest of the countries in the world have not even had the, the audacity to pay 1% uh, of their wealth to transfer that to the least wealthy countries. If you take the rich countries and transfer 1% to the least uh, developed countries, you can put all the 246 million children in school that currently are excluded from education that most likely end up in terrorism if that's what you want, or go to Taliban madras schools and all the other things. This takes 1%. Takes one percent to solve the, 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 the issue of, of poverty, extreme poverty, of a billion people. And that's the same with the wealth that we have created. This morning I was talking at UBS as a coincidence, where they had amassed quite a lot of billionaires because UBS was obviously interested in it, so they need to fill the agenda, so I was the entertainment. But but um, you know, but, but it's bizarre. I was I was up the whole night because I looked at these numbers. I don't know anything about philanthropy other than my own foundations that we have and, and some other things I do. But I looked at the numbers and it's really bizarre what is happening in this world. There are now 2,000 American families, American families because the statistics are available, that have a combined wealth of $4.3 trillion. $4.3 trillion. And collectively, they give away $45 billion. And we applaud them for that. $45 billion on a wealth of four point. Three trillion dollars is 1.2 percent. They give away 1.2 percent of their wealth, and the wealth accumulation, because they have access to private equity, hedge funds that seem to do well. In the last 20 years, we've had a cumulative uh, 8 percent return. These people have a cumulative return of 10 percent or more. So what is happening is they are accumulating far more wealth than they're actually giving away. And the way that they accumulate that far more wealth most likely will do more damage to the way society functions that gives the issues that we have to deal with than the little money that ultimately is being made available to address these issues. So that's a kind of bizarre thing that we need to start thinking about. And is that really a system that we want? Is that really a system that we want? It's, a, it's just a question that, that we need to answer. And we have all the willpower right now to solve these issues that we have. We have all the money. Half the money in the world right now has zero or negative interest rates. So it's not a matter of we don't know how to do it, and it's not a matter of we can do it. It's a matter of do we really want to do it. And any time we walk past a homeless person, we have to ask ourselves, you know, what are we doing to solve this? By staying silent, by not being active on some of the issues that we have by being participants in food waste or, or, or plastic uh, overconsumption, whatever you have. You are complicit to murder nowadays. You're complicit to driving other people into poverty. And I've made a decision a long time ago, uh, although that's difficult to, to live all the, that I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to be part of that. So what can we do individually and collectively to take that responsibility? Do we care? and not have the excuse of we need technology. For 99% of the issues that we face today, we can solve it. And by the way, my argument is it's a darn good economic proposition as well to solve it. On the last thing on stakeholders, and um, uh, the, the, the question was the forces of change. We were talking about uh, uh, income inequality. Is that what you were referring to or any other thing? Sorry? Yes. Yeah. So what... Um, we're now looking at with the OECD, for example, is, is a, a different collective tax system with the OECD countries. They have a plan which is called BEPS, Brand Erosion and Profit Sharing. Can we get some level? Can we get a general uh, tax that is done on turnover, like we're now trying to look at for tech companies? Tech companies, it's a sport not to pay any tax. It's, it's amazing to me that you have an Amazon, which we think is, is heroic. Uh, Jeff Bezos now, you know, 200 billion. <laughs> worse, and, and he's made a hero. But what is that com country, uh, company really doing for society? Uh, they pay zero tax. They have never made money. They've worked a lot of businesses out of business who were employing people, more than Amazon, who were paying taxes, who were providing functions in their communities. So whilst they herald themselves as being the, the saviors that have come down from heaven, I'm not so sure that this equation really holds up if you look at that for humanity. And we, first and foremost, have to defend humanity 
and, and, and let businesses participate that make a positive contribution, not being negative or less bad. So I think people should speak up. Employees of Amazon are speaking up as well. And I'm not picking on Amazon. I'm just giving an example of that, how companies need to start to be more responsible to look at their overall positive uh, footprint. So the sports of not paying tax is a really dangerous sport. At Unilever, we had a 300% return over the 10 years that I was CEO. It's not something I'm proud of. It's something that we did by running a business for all the multiple stakeholders over a longer period of time. Uh, it was a good business model also for returns. But I was proud to pay 27% tax. If you go back to the Unilever books, 27% tax. I was the only company in the UK, and I think globally, who's putting out its tax principles on the website. So people can see how we look at that and be transparent about it. But so companies need to have a new social contract with society. They need to be proud to pay a certain level of tax. Now, you might say, then it's, it's um, uh, unfair competition. I pay tax, others don't pay tax. I understand that. If you don't want that, then be part of a movement with CEOs to start changing the system. You know, I pay pensions in Unilever employees have pensions everywhere in the world. So I pay pension to someone who works for us in Vietnam. If the Vietnamese government doesn't have pension systems, you might say I'm at a disadvantage. I don't think so personally. I think our employees are down more motivated and happy to work for us. Less turnover, whatever, higher, higher productivity. But I also work with the Vietnamese government to put pension systems in place because I think that's normal. So you work on changing the system. So when businesses sit here, they cannot aggravate themselves by fomenting the issues that they're, to some extent, complaining about, and then not wanting to be participants in driving that change. I think that doesn't work anymore if you move forward. And we need to get more of the CEOs to understand that, because otherwise they're not only being voted out of office, their companies are being voted out of business. So these are the movements. The big movement we're now creating is about just transition, talks about attacking corruption, talks about implementing human rights in the value chain, talks about paying fair share of taxes. What's wrong with that? Why can't we have these discussions and why can't we say it's a good thing that we should figure out collectively how to do this? Why should we shy away from that? It doesn't make sense to me. You know, there are many companies that think that they can outsource their value chain and by doing so also outsource their responsibility. I brought a, a 50 CEOs once together of the biggest retailers and biggest manufacturers. And I said, here is John Ruggie's you know, uh, principles of human rights. Which are darn good principles. They're actually enshrined with the UN uh, and also translated for what it means for business. Do we want to sign that? And do we want to collectively work on that? Because value chains are very difficult, very untransparent. And no, we can't. And we get the lawyers and people will attack us. And if we sign something. But by not signing that, you actually agree with what is happening. You agree to slave labor. You agree to sex trade. You agree to child labor. But you're saying basically it's OK. If it is OK, is it OK also for your own children then? Oh, no, 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 no. we are different. We're living on these little islands of prosperity. And we don't really care of the sea of poverty doesn't work anymore. So we have to bring these people to higher moral levels. That's why we're at sight. That's why we have the Colin Myers or the Bob Eccles, the books like Prosperity, to get people to think about a different level of morality. What appeals to me in sight business school was that you have the Bladfernick next door, you have the Smith School and all the others, that we can go to social sciences, political sciences, and create these leaders, create these levels of morality that we need to run the world for the benefit of everybody. Why I asked Paul to be our chair. I think at this point as well, we're going to say goodbye to our viewers from LinkedIn Live as well. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, on behalf of everybody here in the theatre and the adjoining rooms as well, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Paul Pullman and Dean Peter Tofano. Paul, in particular, I would really like to thank you for your precision, your focus, and above all, your straight talking. I 
I think for myself, it's the straight talking that makes the possible seem closer. I know you said it's a Dutch trait, but it really is the thing that cuts through and that was really part of this evening's conversation. So the challenges are clear. And what's also clear is the need for purposeful leadership, which these times demand if we're to navigate our way to the solutions. And we talked about that as well this evening. And it's for that reason that we're so energized and committed at the school to the new Global Leadership Center, the project which is now just getting underway. Housed in the power station, just five minutes from here, the station that brought the first electric light to the city, this fantastic new executive education facility is important to the school because having a space matters. We have convening power, but what this building gives us is a convening space. And that means that the global leaders can come to Oxford to engage with our academics and with each other and to find the answers that we've been talking about today. So it's the value of that space that we are really interested in. And just outside, somebody asked me what are the priorities at the moment. And I can say that this is really one of the main priorities for us in the coming months. And thank you, Rush, for also mentioning it too. And along with all of that are all the other things that go with maintaining the Said Business School as a world-class business school. And I'd like to thank you all for being with us. And I wish you a lovely evening.